the black dog, a sometimes ghostly or demonic figure in folklore. These dogs occur right across the United Kingdom, in the wilder, emptier places where travellers would be at their most vulnerable. In this episode, we will learn of Black Shook, the bar guest, Moddy Doo, the Skriker, and the Wished Hounds. It is not certain where the origins of the black dog come from. The earliest written record is one from France in AD 856 and the earliest in England dates to 1127 AD. But there are similar characteristics shared between many of them. They are all unusually large in size. They have glowing red or yellow eyes, have an aura of foreboding surrounding them. They are often found in locations nearby fairy hills, crossroads, ancient pathways and places where the gallows would have been, and their folklore dots the maps to a rather surprising degree. The Devon folklorist Theo Brown categorised the black dogs into three types, those seemingly demonic hounds that can shapeshift, dogs as large as a calf with shaggy fur, dogs connected to certain places or certain festivals of the year. There is so much written and studied about the black dogs that this could be a theme to return to time and time again. Mostly, these supernatural beasts are dark and terrifying, associated with death, and yet there are tales of some of them being guides and benevolent to lonely travellers on dangerous footpaths. As with all things in folklore, there is never a set character to the dual nature of the fey folk and fairy creatures. So where do they come from? Well, the answers are only speculation. But one thing that we do accept is that the folklore of the black dog has been with us since time immemorial. The Celtic people had their sacred dogs, the Greeks also, and of course the Germanic and Norse have giant dogs as an integral part of their beliefs. Whether it be Gama, the Norse guardian of hell, Kerberos, the guardian of the gates of Hades, the Kinawan, the hounds of the lord of the Celtic otherworld, or any of the other great mythological dogs, they do share a few things. They are powerful, they are big, and they are all associated with the guarding of the gates of the lands of the dead, or the otherworld. So, with all that being said, let's travel down a dark English country lane together, under the moonlight, over the moorlands, with the cold wind kissing at our cheeks and poking its icy fingers down our collars. Let's go hunting for black dogs. The Bar Guest of Yorkshire The Bar Guest is a northern English spectral hound with huge eyes that glow with inner fire and is found mainly in the county of Yorkshire. There are a few explanations for his name that I have found, and three seem to fit quite well. One is the pronunciation of ghost in Northern England as guest, and burg being a colloquial name for a small town, hence the burgess. Another is the Germanic burggeist, mountain ghost, English being a largely Germanic language, this is also a possibility. And another is Bargeist, the ghost of the funeral buyer. The Bargeist is associated with death. It is said to lead or follow the funeral procession heralding the death of well-known locals, howling dreadfully the announcement of their deaths. If any person should get in its way, the dog would slash out with a huge paw, leaving an unhealing wound upon the unfortunate man, woman or even child. One person who had been a witness to this funerary bar guest as a child said this vision was so terrifying he never forgot a moment of it. It had heralded the death of Squire Wade of Newgrange. 
Should this supernatural animal be found lying across the doorway of a home, it foretold the death of one who lived inside. One true tale collected told of a man who had been clock dressing at Grassington. It was later than expected, and although he had had a drink to warm his way, he was by no means drunk. The night was brightly lit by the moon in a clear sky, bright enough to light the whole countryside. As the man travelled, he heard something pass him by, a rattle of chains and a brushing sound. The man stopped and looked around him. All the while he could hear this strange sound, and as he listened he realised it was the awful sound of the barguest that the locals feared so much. The man rushed on, believing that this spectre could not pass over water, and he reached the stream, and over he went, and yet the deathly sound still followed. He reasoned it must have cut him off at the water's head at the spring. The man decided that he would be brave and try and see what the beast looked like. He stopped and he hid. And yet, the road was empty, only the brushing and the sound of chains, and then silence. The man turned to carry back on his way, and the sound started again. So he followed the sound, and as the moon shone bright above, he saw the bar guest's tail. That was quite enough adventure, he decided, and carried on his way home. At last he came to his home, and there, lying across the doorway, was a huge creature, shaggy and ominous. He told it to get away, but it did not move. He grabbed a stick to hit the beast with, and then the animal raised its great head and looked straight at him. Horrified, he saw its eyes were as large as saucers, glowing fiercely. They glowed red and then blue and then white in a great spiralling ring that eventually ended as a small dot. The man grew bolder, commanding it to get up and get out of the way, but all it did was glower at him stubbornly. Eventually, the man could hear his wife coming down the stairs inside, having heard her husband outside and approaching the door where the beast lay. At this sound, the beast finally rose and walked away. The man told his wife, who agreed, that it had been a bar guest, and as he swore it was the truth, he also stated it must have been more afraid of his wife than of him. There is a tale told of and written by William Home, set in the beautiful Yorkshire Dales, one of the prettiest of Yorkshire places to visit. There is a place called Trollus Gill, which is an interesting name with its troll association. It is an eerie looking limestone ravine above the village of Appletreewick. This narrow gorge is as high as 70 foot tall and during heavy rains it becomes a dangerous torrent with the river that flows through there. The gorge is the haunt of a bar guest. It is said that once a young man set out on a dark windy night to carry out an act of dark black magic. His intention was to summon the black dog. He entered the ravine that was as dark as pitch. The sound of raging water filled his ears and a spectral voice called, Forbear. He ignored the warning and carried on through the narrow space. Finally, he reached a large yew tree and beneath this, he drew magical symbols. He spoke sacred words and kissed the earth three times, calling for the Vargas to appear. Fire flashed from the craggy rocks, and with a great leap the bar guest appeared to him. Nothing was heard of the young man evermore. Shepherds passing the place in the fair morning found his lifeless body beneath the yew tree, and upon his chest were marks and scars so strange that it was agreed no human hand could be the culprit. In York, the elegant capital of Yorkshire, 
A bar guest is said to haunt, terrorise and devour lone nighttime travellers in the city as they try to find their way through the tiny alleyways between the ancient buildings that are known locally as Snickleways. There are also tales told of bar guests in Darlington. This one could also shapeshift. At an eerie valley known between Darlington and Hofton near Throstlenest, and near the city of Leeds, a bar guest patrolled an area of wasteland and called Oxwells near Headingley Hill. There is also a bar guest in Whitby, that most gothic of northern Yorkshire towns and full of vampire lore, used as a location by the author Bram Stoker in his novel Dracula. Tales of this beast impressed themselves upon the author so much that he had his vampiric count transform into a great black dog while he is resident in Whitby. The original bar guest of this area, roaming the cold and empty moors around Whitby, would howl in the night, a bone-chilling sound that was an omen of death. Locals would tell that to hear it meant certain doom. The Moddy Do of the Isle of Man the Moddy Do is the Manx black dog that haunts Peel Castle on the west coast of the Isle of Man, a small and fairy folklore filled island that sits between Britain and Ireland. The poet George Waldron was the main source and collector of tales of this folkloric supernatural animal. His sources told him that in the 17th century, when a garrison was based at Peel Castle, the dog would appear. The dog was like the shape of a large spaniel with shaggy fur, haunting every room of the castle, but mostly, often, the guards' chambers, as the candles were being lit at oncoming darkness. This dog would enter and lie before the fire, even in front of all the soldiers there, who, though at first were terrified, they became so used to this strange visitor they accepted its presence as normal. It was recorded that this spectral hound would appear from a passage that once led from Peel Castle through the churchyard grounds and led to the rooms of the captain of the guards. As dusk fell over the castle, the dog would appear from the passage, and as the early dawn light appeared, the hound would slink back to this passage and its daytime lair. The folklorist also recorded a tale of one drunken guard who, feeling rather brave after some drinking, decided to lock the castle gates on his own rather than in a pair as commanded. He snatched up the keys, even though it was not his turn for this duty. He taunted the dog that lay by the fire, taunted it to follow him along the passage and this it did. Normally, the guard, after locking all the castle, was supposed to travel the haunted passage of the dog to return the keys to the captain. However, from inside the guard room, the guards heard strangled and terrible screams from the passageway. They listened to it all, and then the once drunken guard burst into the room, terrified. He could not even speak of what he had seen, or what had happened, but only three days later that man passed away. After this ghastly event, the passage was finally sealed up and a new route was taken by guards as night fell. The Moddy Do was never seen in that place again. There have been other sightings of this particular black dog around the beautiful strange Isle of Man though. There is a field called Robin Gate, or Robin of the Road, near Balamoda. This place was haunted by the Moddy Do. At Bally Gilbert Glen, also known as Kinlies Glen, there could once be found a farmhouse with a lane leading to it. This lane was haunted by a headless Moddy Do, as if the normal black dog wasn't bad enough. It was recorded that in 1927 near Ramsey and close by Milltown Corner, one was sighted, black and with long shaggy hair, 
eyes like coals of fire. The man was too afraid to go past the dog as it stared deeply at him. Eventually, the dog stood aside to let him pass by. Knowing the folklore, the man took the omen to heart. Shortly after the sighting, his father passed away. In 1931, a local doctor was driving that same road at that very same corner and he came across a huge black dog the size of a car with bright staring eyes. The doctor passed the beast on the way to see a patient and it was still there on his return. However, it was not recorded if the patient or anyone else passed away after this particular sighting. An interesting tale is told of a supernatural dog in Peel, one that saved the lives of several men. In Peel Harbour, a boat full of fishermen was moored. These men were waiting for their captain to arrive so that they could go night fishing, but the man never arrived. As early morning came a sudden storm that lashed the seas and the harbour, Beyond doubt, the fishermen knew that they would not have returned from that fishing trip alive. They would have been lost at sea. Finally, the skipper of the boat arrived as all was calmer. He told his crew of a strange tale. As he had been heading towards the harbour along the road, a black dog appeared and would not let him pass. If he turned one way, it would move to stop him. If it turned the other, it did the same. In the end, the captain gave up and went back home. The Moddy Do had stopped him heading out with the crew, and the Moddy Do had saved all of their lives. The Skryker, or Trash, of Lancashire. In the northwest of England sits the county of Lancashire. It's one of those places that is full of dark folklore renowned in history for the Victorian Industrial Revolution, a place of heavy leaden skies, black peaty moorland and beautiful strange Gothic architecture. It is often a harsh landscape, but darkly romantic. The black dog from this county has two names, the Skryker and Trash. The name Skryker is a colloquial word for shrieker or screecher. As a Lancashire lass myself, I still use the word skrike, as in the baby is skriking, the baby is shrieking. So, a piercing alarm call that demands attention. This black dog is also found in the neighbouring county of Yorkshire, and like so many others, is a portent of doom and can be an omen of death. The beast wanders the dark roads at night and also the woodlands, emitting a loud and haunting skrike, often invisible, but when it does take shape, it is that of the familiar black dog with massive menacing paws, glowing saucer-sized eyes, the usual shaggy coat. It is huge. The other name Lancastrians have for the black dog is trash, which is another colloquial word, this time for trudge, or slog, that hard walk usually through difficult terrain, and so this name is believed to come from the splashing sound that the dog's paws make, as though treading through soft mud in old shoes, trashing, or trudging through wet land. There is a tale of a bold young man named Adam, who, one cold winter night in mid-December, left the village of Chipping for his home that lay by the side of the River Hodder, a few miles away. The ground had a covering of snow, and beneath his feet the road was as ice. Despite the cold, the man could not help but notice just how beautiful the countryside looked. The hills of Parlick and the sweeping Longridge and Thornley Heights covered with its fir trees, and Kemple End too, they were clearly visible in the cold, silvery moonlight. The night was perfectly still, except for a soft sighing of the wind as it rustled through the frosty branches of the roadside trees, bare of leaves above Adam. 
Each sigh of wind shook tiny flakes of glittering snow on the man who was walking beneath. The little stream close by was sleeping under ice, and the small cottages of the locals that had been cosily asleep for hours lay covered in snow, seeming almost so small they looked like dwarven houses. Although Adam was a bold man, there was just something strange about this night, an unearthly quality, something oppressive in the deadly silence. To rouse himself, Adam sang loud the songs that he and his friends had been singing at the Patton Arms public house that he had not long left. Little by little, though, his voice began to falter, and he wished so much that he was near home, passing over the nearby stream, but he was still some way away, and now a distant church, clocks began to strike twelve. At the final strike of the church bell, a cloud passed over the moon, spreading darkness over the land. The gentle wind became stronger, howling in the branches, and the snow of the hedges was thrown into Adam's face. Though the noise of the wind was loud, Adam thought he could hear other sounds, wicked and unearthly sounds, taunting him, and it took all of his strength not to turn around and run back to the village that stood at the bottom of Parlick Hill. But surely, if he turned back now and ran away, all of the villages and even the pub would be closed up tight for the night. No, Adam must carry on home. If he could just cross over the stream, he might be safe, as he knew that no fairy folk, no boggarts or bogles could pass over running water. He was so close to the bridge when he heard a most dreadful sound. This was the sound of feet passing by him, crunching in the snow, yet whatever made the sound was completely invisible. He stood heart pounding in the darkness, and there came from the air a terrifying howl. He stood transfixed by the noise, and then another howl from somewhere ahead. At this he took a step forwards in the direction of that noise, and at this very moment the moon appeared from behind the clouds. Light shone upon the road, and there, in the road, on the middle of the bridge, was a hideous great black dog, shaggy with fur, huge eyes burning with fire. He knew immediately it was the Skriker. Adam, with not a gram of sense left to him for fear, stepped forwards towards the beast, yet as he did, the strange creature glided back away, mimicking his own pace. Always the terrible hellish eyes looked straight into Adam's own eyes. Step by step, Adam crossed the bridge, and little by little, he began to panic as he realised his danger, and then he began to run. Before him stood a small cottage, one pale light burning in a bedroom window above. Adam tried to cry for help, but no words came from his mouth, only a strange, terrified, garbled noise. Before he could help himself, he had run past the cottage, and he was travelling again alone and helpless. He ran on this way for some time, the shadows of the hedges and the trees taunting him. The only light was the light from those horrible eyes, and then he tripped on a stone and he fell. In sheer terror, waiting for the jaws of the Skriker to bite him, he dragged himself to his feet and found the Skriker had gone. Young Adam sighed in relief, taking a seat upon a heap of stones. His legs were quivering now with exhaustion, and his skin was covered in the cold sweat of fear. He trembled at the memory of the huge dog. He knew he must go on, though. He took handfuls of snow to clear the sweat from his face and sharpen his senses. Finally, he lifted himself and began once more to walk the road home. He had passed a little old pretty house at a place called Chugley, where a guard dog yelping frightened him at the memory of the black dog. And he had just reached a bend in the road near wooded Kemple End when a blast of wind shook the trees around him. The scenery now, 
it did not look so beautiful. The sighing wind was not so pretty. Instead, everything looked and sounded haunted. The winds were like the sighs of the dead, and suddenly there was a silence again. The wind fell, and all was still once more. And this was even more terrifying. A dread, heavy silence surrounded him, and then the scream of the Skriker once more. He knew he had to escape. He was so close to home. But he also knew that like before, he would soon see that hideous hell-like dog. And then there it stood, in the middle of the bridge that crossed the river Hodder, the bridge he must cross to home. Maybe it was because he was so close to his cottage that a flicker of bravery entered Adam's heart, and he stepped forwards, seeing the beast drift backwards just as it had done before. He could see his cottage by the river, and he boldly walked towards it, and the Skriker moved towards it too. At last he was at his cottage, and in front of the door the Skriker stood, stopping Adam's way. He felt himself pulled towards the black dog against his own will, and in a fit of terror as he grew closer to the spectral animal, he hit out, but his hand hit the oaken door instead. The Skriker now walked silently away, and Adam collapsed to the floor. Inside the house, Adam's family could hear the noise, and they dragged the poor man to safety. But he was so paralysed with fear, he could not even tell them what had happened. After many hours, Adam managed to tell them his terrible story, and the face of his wife grew white, because she knew what this meant an oncoming death. Not three days after the Skriker had appeared to Adam, his eldest boy child was carried home. The poor boy had drowned. During the child's funeral, Adam's wife caught a dreadful chill, and with only a few weeks, she had become so ill she also passed away and was buried at Mitten Churchyard. The whole supernatural episode, and because of his intense grief, Poor Adam lost his senses. His mind was broken. For many long years after, he would wander the roads, searching for the Skriker, his eyes wild with madness and his arms reaching for something that just wasn't there. And his sad tale was told for many years by the firesides of many a house. The Black Shook of East Anglia East Anglia is another very haunting place, a very flat stretch of land, often flat as far as the eye can see, and crisscrossed by rivers and streams that's often marshy and swampy. It is known now for its river boating holidays, fun to be had sailing through the reed-lined waterways, deep dark water lapping at the boats, a truly beautiful and unique landscape. And yet, on dark evenings, as the colder times come close, there is usually a spectral mist that hangs over many of these beautiful places. The rivers create ghosts of their own. And it is here that we can find Black Shook, the ancient black dog of East Anglia. His territory covers the counties of Norfolk, Suffolk, Cambridgeshire, Lincolnshire, and into parts of Essex. His other names are Old Shook, Old Shock, Shock, or just Shook. And there was always belief that this dog arrived with the Viking people who settled and raided these coastal areas. This beast roams the coastline and countryside of the counties, also the churchyards. And although, like other black dogs of England, it can be a portent of death, Shook can also be a travelling companion for lone travellers in these very empty lands. The name Shook has its roots in the old English word skooker, meaning devil or fiend, and this in turn comes from the word skoo, meaning to terrify. Indeed, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle mentions this dreadful black dog, so it has been recorded for a very, very long time. 
As with all the other black dogs, his visage is very familiar by now. He is shaggy, fiery unearthly eyes, huge in size, and it is said that even the howl of this great beast will chill your blood. His footsteps are silent, and if you see him, you will be filled with a terror, as often his visage tells that you may be in your grave before the end of the year. And Shook has only one huge eye, burning with firelight, and right in the middle of his forehead. There are some incredibly famous recordings of Black Shook, one of these being the one recorded in 1577 by Abram Fleming in his A Strange and Terrible Wonder. This occurred at St Mary's Church in Bungay and at Bliber Church, and the evidence of the visit of Shuck can still be seen to this day. On Sunday the 4th of August in the year 1577 at Blythburgh in Suffolk, there was a terrible storm. As Fleming's account from 1577 says, it was with such unwanted force and power, the church did as it were quake and stagger. Of course, it being a Sunday, the local church was full of parishioners, even despite the horrendous storm, and these gathered good folk shivered in terror in the pitch blackness that fell upon the congregation in the church. During the flashes of lightning and thundercracks, a huge black dog appeared in the church. This hellish beast prowled up the aisle, choosing its victims. It killed a man and a boy. It burned the hand of another man. It blasted other worshippers and brought the steeple of the church crashing through the roof. The dog then paced to the church door and pushed it open with its flaming claws leaving burn marks there that can be seen to this very day. Black Shook headed to St Mary's Church in Bungay, where it swiftly ran up and down the interior of the church. Fleming says that the dog passed between two people as they were kneeling, occupied in prayer, wrung the necks of them both at one instant clean backwards, in so much that where they kneeled, they strangely died. Another man fell victim. This poor soul was attacked on the back by the hound. The man instantly shriveled up within himself, as the mouth of a purse of a bag drawn together with a string. Despite his horrific injuries, this man survived and became renowned in the area. Shook had not finished his rampage in the church. One account from the time says that surrounded by flames, the dog then slew many people. And as he had done at Blythburgh, he left the church leaving burn marks on the door as before, and all the mechanics of the church clock were destroyed in an instant. To this day, the marks on the door is still known as the devil's fingerprints. The poet and singer-songwriter Martin Newell was researching black dog stories of East Anglia for his project of writing an epic poem themed around the Shook. As part of his research, he spoke to many locals from the area and gathered many tales of sightings. One he was told by a woman who in the 1950s was returning home from a dance when she had seen black Shook. Another man had been crossing the marshlands at Felixstowe and had come across the strange black dog. Searching through old local newspapers, Martin Newell also found an account from the 1930s of a midwife who was cycling near the village of Tolshunt Darcy in Essex on a winter's night. The terrible shook had followed her and no matter how quickly she pedalled, that dog kept pace with her through all the lonely country lanes. At last, the strange and terrifying supernatural black dog had simply vanished. The Wished Hounds and the Curse of Squire Cabell The county of Devon in the southwest of England also has some interesting black dog folklore. And these legends 
are set on Dartmoor. In this county, the dog is not only a single sighting, but can also hunt in a deadly pack. And Dartmoor is a strange piece of land. The strange landscape itself has heaps of natural granite boulders that stand castle-like on the tops of moorland hills. These are tours. The atmosphere of the moor can change in the blink of an eye, from the most picturesque perfect sunny day to a howling, frozen, threatening landscapes of bogs, mires and empty places. And this is one of the reasons why it holds such a fascination. And another reason are its strange legends, of which there are many. It is the legends of the spectral dogs of Dartmoor that inspired Conan Doyle's masterpiece, The Hound of the Baskervilles, and visiting the places that took hold of his imagination, one can surely see why. So, we shall begin with the wished hounds of Dartmoor, the dogs of the wild hunt. The traditions of supernatural wild hunts spans many countries, and so it is no wonder that Dartmoor, a vortex for folklore and myth, has its own version. In this, the huntsman is called Dewar. He appears on nights of howling cold winds, when the windows rattle and the gusts scream through the boughs of the trees. It is believed by some that Dewar is the devil himself, and others say that he is also Old Crocken, the spirit of the moor. Even Sir Francis Drake was believed to be the huntsman during the Elizabethan era, his punishment for dabbling in too much sorcery. However, most believe that Dewar is the devil, and he rides his great dark skeletal horse over the hills and through the valleys, followed by the phantoms he has hunted and gathered, and also followed by his wished hounds. These spectral black dogs are huge and horrible in size, eyes burning with fire and jaws filled with sharp yellow teeth that drip with foam. There are places associated with the legend, namely Dewarstone and Wistman's Wood. Both are places where he haunts, and also where the hounds are said to have their kennels. Both places are extremely strange in both atmosphere and look. It is said that those unfortunate travellers who meet Dewar and his hounds will not live to see the end of the year, and any fool who tries to follow them will be led to their death. The huntsmen and hounds gallop at full pace on and on, only to leap from the Dewar stone itself and disappear. The foolish follower will leap also, with a much unhappier ending, and as the victim falls, it is said the booming laughter of Dewar rings out along with the baying of his hounds and peals of thunder. Dewar has claimed another life. Locals once told that a single human footprint was found at the very edge of the Dewar stone, and behind this were imprints of cloven hooves in the dirt. It is believed that Dewar hunts for many things, the souls of unbaptized children, those who have led wicked lives, and those foolish enough not to hide from him as he appears. There is a tale told on Dartmoor that a local farmer, riding home late one night and brave in his copse after a merry evening spent at one of the moorland inns, came across Dewar and the wish hounds. The farmer shouted to Dewar, asking him if he had had good hunting that night and what was his prey. Dewar lifted his dark sunken eyes and replied, he would give the farmer a gift of his kill, tossing a bundle of rags to him. The farmer tucked the bundle under his arm and rode back to his farm. And once there he dismounted and as he got to his own doorstep, he opened the bundle to peer inside, and inside was the body of his own child. There is a very interesting legal case from the 1870s, 
a man's body was found by the side of Dartmoor's River Yelm. No cause of death was obvious to the professionals, and so the coroner wanted to record the death as struck down by the wild hunt, or at the very least, death by supernatural agency. However, this would not do in legal terms, and so he was persuaded to mark accidental death. In the 1890s, a stableman working at Oakhampton declared that he had heard the wished hounds in full cry, leaping across the moor above the town, and his horses were absolutely terrified. The association with Wistman's Wood comes from the belief that this is one place that the hounds live, and trust me with the weird boulders that are there surrounded by dark fairy tale stunted oaken trees and drapes of hanging moss, nothing would surprise me. And some also call them the Yep Hounds. Above Wistman's Wood is one of the ancient lichways. These are the corpse roads on which people had to carry their deceased loved ones to the official churches for burial. These are lonely, desolate, haunted paths, treacherous in places also. No wonder ghostly creatures fill the place. Phantom funeral processions have even been seen walking this path above the woodland to this very day. The tale of wicked Squire Cabell also has a pack of hounds, punishers of this despicable human being. Near Buckfastley, a most beautiful little moorland town with a stunning monastery where the monks there brew their famous wine, the legend of evil Squire Cabell is still told, and it is this portion of the moor that the man haunts. He was indeed a monstrously evil man, and powerful too, a persecutor of all the folk that worked for him and his tenants. It was even said that Cabell had murdered his own wife and sold his soul to the devil. When he died at the end of the 1600s, the local people gave a huge sigh of relief, but that relief was not to last very long. Cabell in his life had been obsessed with hunting, and death would not stop this man's passion. On the night of his burial, a great pack of strange devil dogs appeared, galloping over the moor to his tomb. There they stopped, and they paced and finally stood still, all of them howling. The ghost of Cabell rose from his tomb to lead the dogs in a wild moorland hunt. And this became a regular occurrence, especially on the anniversary of Cabell's death. The good folk of Buckfastley were terrified of the unearthly howls, the mad shrieks and the insane barking. They decided to try and put an end to their misery once and for all. They worked together to haul a great slab of granite towards Cabell's grave, and there they pushed and pulled it until the grave was covered with it. Next, they constructed an iron cage like a mausoleum over the whole lot, and this finally seemed to have worked. Squire Cabell's antics were put to an end. To this date, the dare of the local children and youths is to stretch their arms in through the bars of the cage-like structure and touch the grave of Squire Cabell in the hope that the wicked ghoul will not grab them and drag them inside. These legends, along with the peculiar landscape of Dartmoor and also its great prison, are some of the elements that inspired Sir Arthur Conan Doyle so much, hardly surprising with him being so passionate about supernatural creatures and folklore. And so ends our tales of walks with black dogs. There are many more, single dogs and packs of hounds, but these were my favourites of the moment. I wonder if any of you have had strange dog encounters. My husband and his best friend did once. Not a terrifying encounter, but one that definitely gave them something to think about. For now, I shall leave you with a thought and a plea. The thought, if you ever need to escape a black dog, try and make for running water. And the plea, Wisman's Wood.
Please, if you visit Dartmoor and go to Whistman's Wood, please don't actually go into the woodland itself. They are having a lot of problems there with tourism and visitors, and although Dartmoor, it is beautiful and a beautiful place to visit, the actual woodland, which is extremely ancient, is having a real problem with the mosses and the lichens. The amount of footfall has damaged some of these, and they're asking that for the moment nobody goes inside the woodland so that it can recover. It's very ancient, one of the most ancient in the land, and I'm sure it would be grateful for our respect. So, until next time, dear friends, keep well, brightest of blessings, and remember, don't play with the fairy folk, or you may end up in one of my folk tales yourself.